Do you have as well? Um, so when I was walking in, um, Shalish told me um, we have a political rally to address. <laughs> so I hope it's not a political rally. Yeah? We end up being a, a bit more interesting. So, <clears throat> see the whole concept of what I want to sort of do is I really don't want to, there are a few slides I will take you. Um, I, I really want, don't want to emphasize on the slides as much. I want this to be more of an interaction. Um, because at the end of it, I think you should, there has to be some sort of a feeling that has to change. So I was uh, more interested in that interaction. So, to start with, we, we have what, 100 people in this room? So just start off, uh, all of you know me? Yes. Yes? yes. yes. So I can avoid the introduction. That's, that's the point. <laughs> I, can, I can do that, right? Okay. So <clears throat> just put your hands up of whoever in this room is a manager. Okay. How many of you, including and excluding, who put your hands up, believe you are a leader? Whether you are designated a leader in the organization is a different concept altogether. In your minds, how many of you believe you are a leader? <laughs> That's good. That's about uh, five times the number of hands that went in for a manager. So that's a pleasing start, right? So <clears throat> what I want to do is basically sort of um, stir up this honestness a bit, right? So I will I will put some few things to you. I want you to come back and so start by <clears throat> let's start by thinking about this whole whole session. We are trying to talk about what is leadership, right? And how do you develop leadership? In people? Um, there are a lot of books written on it. I will try and avoid the books. I will try and avoid all scientific jargons. I will try and work on something which is close to your heart. We'll try and see whether we can get there, right? So, um, what in your view, as a very simple term, do you think is leadership? Oh, I want to hear just one or two views. What is leadership? Why is it? What is it? We all talk about great leaders, charismatic leaders, oratory leaders. Can you make a difference? The ability to make a difference. Motivation. Of responsibility. Taking on some sort of responsibility. Inspire okay. people. Inspire. Okay, so I'll just pick the pick the key words, right? So you say make a difference, right? Or make a change. I would rather call it as a change. <coughs> yeah? What what do you say? Responsibility. Take on responsibility. Yeah, I would expand that a bit more and call it accountability. Okay? Uh, taking initiatives based on a particular, you know, circumstances or situation. Or the situation. So you say the decision making. So decision making is the principle. Decision. Set up a goal to achieve. Okay. People who are goal oriented, who have, I would, I would expand this to also make it. Reach. Steering towards positive change. So, so change could be. Positive, that is a, a personal view, right? A positive change for somebody could be a negative change for somebody else. Drive the things by taking ownership. Yeah, so we have that, right? It's a combination of this two. Great, the great the communicator. What did you just say? Communicate. Requires. Communicator, yeah. Motivate. Motivate. Optimist. Hmm? What did you just Optimism. say? <coughs> yeah. Uh, is optimistic. Optimistic, right? I will expand this and I'll cover, I will talk a bit more about passion. And we'll talk about that. Yeah. Priya, how many of you think uh, leadership is all science? Is there a science in leadership? Put your hands up. How many of you think there's science in leadership? It's art and science. science. We'll, come, we'll come to that in a moment. We'll come to that in a moment. That is the whole idea. How many, because there's management science, right? All leaders are MBAs and there's management and management is a science. So how many of you think there's a science now that I've told you this? Put your hands up. Okay. I'll, I'll just write this and I'll come to why I'm writing this. How many of you think there's art? A lot more people think there's art in management. How many of 
you think leadership is all about position? No. The position of the person who is involved. Or the accountability of the person who is involved. Um, yeah. So is position or accountability important for leadership at all? Yes. No. yes. So you can have leader who has got no position or no accountability. Yes. If you are a leader, you will automatically get that position. So that's a consequence. <laughs> My question is, can you have a leader who has no position or no accountability? No. 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 So position and accountability are important. Yes. 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 How important is passion or energy? Very important. Most important. It is? Okay, so you think there has to be, and we'll cover uh, why passion is important and where passion comes from. <coughs> we'll come back to you why it's on two sides. How important is in leadership? Structure, structure a design, an organization model. Something which is all structured, there's a framework. So you define a framework, you define a structure, you're very structured in your thoughts, your approach, you have a plan. How important is it? Do you, how many of you think that is important to have a structure? What if, how important is it to be ambiguous? Sometimes it's not very clear, right? Do you think a leader should also have the ability to be ambiguous? Yes. 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 Put your hands up who you think there is uh, ambiguity is equally important in the relationship. Okay. <coughs> How important do you think? Um, so along with structure, I will also put. Uh, yeah. How important do you think is a struct logic in, in decision making and in, in, in leadership? Should, should all the leaders have logic? Yes. yes. So you can't do any leadership decision which has no logic? No. You can't. So logic is important? Yes. Okay. How important do you think is gut feel? Yes. I think it's right. Time. I have no logic. Conviction. So conviction. Yes. The other word of gut feel and conviction. <laughs> Do you think that's important? Yes. You have yes. conviction. Okay. Let's we'll stop here for a moment. There are other things as well. So there are things that you talked about here, goal, vision. Yeah, one more thing. The other thing is, how important is planning in leadership? Yes. Crucial? Yes. You can't do a leadership without no, planning? No. I can't be a leader at all without planning? I can. How important is for you to communicate? As a leader, how important is talking? How important is, to, is, is it for a leader to talk? Very much. Very much. Very much. What is more important, a plan or to communicate? Communicate. 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 <laughs> okay, you'll see that these are written on two sides of it. I consciously wrote those on two different sides. Why do you think they are on two different sides? So where does this come from? Books. <laughs> where does this come from? So what is more important in leadership? Is it the heart or the head? It's a combination. Of the you cannot. <laughs> so you need to have both. Yes. You need to. And that is what you say, you think from your head, you execute with your heart. Successful leaders are those who are able to think through your head and execute with your heart. You need all of this. 
I will pick out a couple of these because some of these are very easy to understand. And the reason I said these are the head, we can teach you this. You can go to an MBA school and get taught. Formal classroom coaches will teach you how the head things will work. This comes from experience. So the first message I'm going to tell you is, I can't teach you anything. At the end of this session, you will come up with an experience or a feeling. And leadership is as much a feeling as there is theory. So unless you have the feeling that I'm a leader, which is why I started off asking how many of you in your heart. Because when I asked that question, did it appeal to your head or did it appeal to your heart? When I asked you the question, how many of you are leaders, did you answer that through your heart or through your head? Heart. So unless you feel in your heart that you are a leader, you can't think as a leader. And there will be some reasons why we'll come to on what you can think and on, on how we can make this work. And both are equally important. You can't just feel in your heart and have none of this. You'll feel. You still need to. You can't just say, I feel in my heart I'm a great, great leader, and you can't go and lead. You'll feel. Right? And the same thing if you've got all your structure in place, you know the signs, you know you have in a position of accountability, you have the right position, you have the people below you, you have all the logic, you have the plan. I don't communicate. I have no conviction. I have I can't work with ambiguity. I can't have passion. Will you succeed? No. So you right? So leadership and leadership development is a fraction of both the heart and the head. And unless you are able to balance both, and you are able to understand why both of these are important, then you will not be able to succeed. Let's see if we can do a small video, and um, I'll give you a bit of um, background of this. Um, how many of you have seen the TED forums, TV? How many of you put your hands up, right? There's a lot of um, management talk. There's a lot of leaders who come to these TED forums, right? Um, and they speak about their experiences and stuff <coughs> on, on these TED forums. Strangely, about a, about a year or a year and a half ago, there was a very unexpected guest in this TED forum. There's a small boy who comes from Kenya. Right? So let's see if I can collect my laptop to it, and then we'll, we'll, we'll dwell a bit on those topics to say why. This is where I live. I live in Kenya, at the south parts of the Nairobi National Park. Those are my dad cows at the back, and behind the cows, that's the Nairobi National Park. Nairobi National Park is not fenced in the south where I live, which means wild animals like zebras migrate out of the park freely. So predators like lions follow them, and this is what they do. They kill our livestock. This one of the cows which was killed at night, and I just woke up in the, in the morning and I found it dead. And I felt so bad, because it was the only bull we had. My community, the Maasai, we believe that we came from heaven with our, all our animals and all the land for hurting them, and that's why we value them so much. So. I grew up hating lions so much. The Morans are the warriors who protect our community and the livestock. And they are so upset about this problem. So they killed the lions. It's one of the six lions which are killed in Nairobi. And I think this is why the Nairobi National Park lions are few. So a boy from six to nine years old in my community is responsible for his dad cows. And that's the same same thing which happened to me. So I had to find a way of solving this problem. And the first idea I got was to use fire, because I thought lions were scared of fire. But I came to realize that that didn't really help, because it was even helping the lions to see, to see through the cow shed. So I didn't give up. I continued. And the second idea I got was to use a scarecrow 
I was trying to trick the lions that I was standing near the cow shed. But lions are very clever. <laughs> they will come the first day and they see the scarecrow and they go back. But the second day, they'll come and they say, this thing is not moving here, it's always here. <laughs> so <laughs> he jumps in and kills the animals. So one night I was walking around the cow shed with a torch and that day the lions didn't come. And I discovered that lions were afraid of a moving light. So I had an idea. Since I was a small boy, I used to work in my room for the whole day. And I even took apart my mom's new radio. And that day, she almost killed me, but... <laughs> <laughs> but I learned a lot about electronics. <laughs> so I got an old car battery, an indicator box, the small device found in the motorcycle, and it helps motorists when they want to turn right a left, it blinks, and I got a switch where I can switch on the lights on and off. And that's a small touch from a broken flashlight. So I set up everything. As you can see, the solar panel charges the battery, and the battery supplies the power to the small indicator box. I call it a transformer. And the indicator box makes the lights to flash. And as you can see, the bulbs face outside because that's where the lions come from. And that's how it looks to lions when they come at night. The lights flash and trick lions that I was walking around the couch but I was sleeping in my bed. <laughs> Thanks. So I set it up in my home two years ago and since then, you have never experienced any problem with the lions. And my neighboring homes heard about this idea. One of them was this grandmother. She had a lot of uh, animals being killed by lions. And she asked me if I can put the lights for her. And I said, yes. So I put the lights. You can see at the back, those are the lion lights. Since now, I've set up seven bombers around my community. And they're really working. And my idea is also being used now in all over Kenya for scaring other predators like hyenas, leopards, and also it's also being used to scare elephants away from people's farms. Because of this invention, I was lucky to get a scholarship in one of the best schools in Kenya, Brookhouse International School, and I'm really excited about this. My new school now is coming in and helping by fundraising and creating an awareness. I even took back my friends to my community and we're installing the lights to the homes which don't have and I'm teaching them how to put them. So one year ago, I was just a boy in the savannah grassland hiding my father's cows and I used to see planes flying over and I told myself that one day I'll be there inside. So, and uh, here I am today. Uh, I got a, a chance to come by plane for my first time for TED. So, my big dream is to become an aircraft engineer and pilot when I grow up. I used to ride lions, but now because my invention is saving my father's cows and the lions, we are able to stay with the lions without any conflict. Surely, it means in my language. Thank you very much. <laughs> you, you have no idea how, how exciting it is to hear a story like yours. So, you've got this scholarship. Yep. You're working on other electrical inventions. What's yeah. the next one on your list? Um, my next invention is I want to make an electric fence. Electric fence. But I know electric fences are already invented, but I want to make mine. <laughs> Did, didn't <laughs> you already tried it once, right? And you <laughs> I've tried it before, but um, I, I stopped because uh, it gave me a shock. <laughs> <laughs> In the trenches. Richard Terreri, you are something else. We're going to cheer you on every step of the way, my friend. Thanks. Thank you so much. Uh,
let's do some introspection for about five minutes to say what struck you in this? <coughs> the zeal to solve the problem. Passion. An idea can change the life. Plan, 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 but in this exercise, was he a leader? Yes. 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 What is the most striking sentence that each one of you felt in that? <clears throat> there were at least two sentences which struck me, but I want to hear one of the two sentences that or two or three that struck you. Electric fence is already there, but he wanted to make it. I want to create my own. I, to create my own. I know it has already been done, but I want to create mine. That's a very powerful statement. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Goes into ownership, accountability. I want to do it. I. I know it's there, but I want to do it. One more. There was one more sentence that he said which struck me. I think there will be more which struck you. I'll be there one day. Right. So he's able to come to the conflict. I like one more sentence when he said, <clears throat> when I was a boy and I used to see the aircraft flying, I have a dream. So, the ability, the vision, <coughs> I would be there. So, so I think uh, the interesting part about this is, I mean, obviously the guy got a scholarship, the, the child got a scholarship, he's in the best school, and he, he is on the path of invention. <coughs> So the theme of this may be invention, but the, the underlying characteristic is that of leadership. <coughs> Where I am able to embrace leadership. And I am able to come back and say, what is leadership? What does it mean to me? And it's about passion. About passion. Can I have the red pen somewhere, which I, have, I must have kept it there? Okay. There's one more thing in this, which um, <clears throat> I did not write earlier. I was waiting for this to finish, which is, Authenticity. What is authenticity? <coughs> what do you mean as authentic? What is authentic? Genuine. Real. <coughs> so leadership can also needs to be authentic. <coughs> Only then you follow leaders. And I'll come to one, another example where you say, you have to believe the guy was authentic. Mm -hmm. He was speaking with his heart and he was, and what is important for you to, so if you, when do you say something is authentic? When do you say something is real? What? But also when you have evidence that it is working. You have felt it, you have experienced it, right? You buy a perfume and you say, this is authentic. Why do you say so? Because you have experienced it. So it is an experiential feeling. Authenticity only comes from experience. So when leaders are supposed to be authentic, <coughs> there may be leaders who are authentic as well. Do all your political leaders look authentic? <laughs> <laughs> they are all leaders, aren't they? They lead the country. Right? Are they authentic? No. Some are, some aren't. Right? So how do you make up your mind whether leadership can be authentic? My experience. When you can see evidence, and where does that evidence come in when the person <laughs> comes back and practices what he talks about? You have to show evidence. So if I have to be a leader and I have, I have to show evidence of passion. I have to show evidence of being able to deal with ambiguity. I have to show evidence of conv conviction. I have to communicate. I can have all this, but if I remain quiet, how do you know? Unless you can hear 
you can't read a mind, right? So you have to see it. You've got to experience it. It is all about experience, which is why I said at the end of this session, I want you not to go back with theoretical terms. I want to, you to go back with a feeling of experience, or the experience of leadership. Leadership is an experience. You have to experience it. So if you have to be authentic, <coughs> or if you have to be an authentic leader, you have to practice some of this, or all of this. There may be more. OK? So now, let's take a bit of a, a theory, because you also need to understand some bit of theory for you to be able to experience it as well. So I'll put a few slides on, very few slides. Um, but that, that will cover the theory. So now you have done the feeling part. You, you have heard it, you have seen a case, you feel it. <coughs> there is a PPT, I think I have opened it because I am not working on It will, look, it, it will not have a lot of technical jargons, but it won't. It's more simplistic, I'm trying to make it. How do you become the boss? Everybody's aim in life to become the boss. Isn't it? Nobody can teach you. So this class, if you came into the expectation into this session to say, at the end of the session, somebody will teach me how to be the boss, unfortunately, you'll be disappointed. Right? It, can, it can't be taught in a classroom. Leadership cannot be taught in a classroom. The science of leadership, yes, you may be able to. This is why I said you have to first, let's let's get your heart first. This is what I sorted. Now let's get your head for some time, right? So on the head side, yes. But you acquire it. It's an acquisition, right? So again, let me bring one more controversial topic here. A lot of people say born leader. This guy is a born leader. So let me ask, are leaders born? No. No. How many of you think he's, a leader is born? There are no born leaders. Everybody is me. Every leader that we see, we acknowledge as a leader today, is me. And they have acquired that skill. And they have acquired that through on-job experiences. Now, this job could be anything. The job that you do. Do you have leaders in sanitary workers? Yes. There are leaders there as well. Yes. They have experienced that there are leaders, there are very strong cases of leadership coming from the lowermost strata of our community. Right? So it has got nothing to do with which strata of society you belong to, what level of education you have. Right? You have to acquire it. Read the next two sentences. Whereas it also comes from, normally a lot of leadership also comes from adverse experience. Mm. Leadership does not come from pleasant experience. All through your life, if you had pleasant experiences, the chances of you becoming a leader are generally low. Why? Because you will not learn. Right? Look at a child who is brought up as a single child. Okay? A, lot, lot, lot of, a lot of the parents nowadays have one child because of difficulties in upbringing and all. Yeah? But when the child is one child and the child gets everything the child needs, Right. It's a very pleasant life. Doesn't need to share. Doesn't need to learn. Do you think that child will acquire some of the leadership qualities that you saw in the other person? Mm -hmm. yeah. Because there are no adverse circumstances which is forcing me to learn. Because remember this: when you have an adverse circumstance, how do you overcome the adverse circumstance? By finding a solution. And to find a solution, you will learn. <clears throat> so adverse experience. Right. So if it's a new manager, that that new manager. To overcome that interest experience has to do what? Has to go beyond his current capability. So if I'm a leader and I need to develop my leadership, I'm facing an adverse circumstance. I have, for me to overcome that, I have to overcome my current and which is what we tend to call in management terminology as comfort zone. Moving outside the comfort zone. Are you forced to move outside the comfort zone? You have to be forced to move. So sometimes when people talk about rotations, I don't like this job. It is not my core competency. What people say, right? My core competency is in this, you're trying to put me here. I don't like it. What are you trying to do? You're trying to resist an adverse circumstance. 
And by resisting that adverse circumstance, you're not trying to learn how to cope with it. And if you're not trying to learn how to cope with it, you're not dealing with ambiguity, you don't have the conviction, you are don't, you're not trying to work with passion. So all I'm, 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 I'm not saying that that's the only way to learn, but you have to deal with adverse Because a leader in one stage of life may not be the leader in the next stage of life. And leadership itself changes. What you were successful with yesterday, the skills and the competencies, you will not be successful tomorrow. Because the circumstances under which you were successful yesterday are not the circumstances you're, you're going to deal with tomorrow. Okay? And how does he acquire that? Trial and error. There is no magic bullet. If people have become good leaders, understand they have gone through difficult circumstances. They have learned it the hard way. There is not something which is a magic bullet that can give you 10 trips. So you can read a lot of books, it says 10 management trips, 10 leadership tips. They are tips. It doesn't make you leaders. You have to experience it. Can somebody help me move on? A leader's role, I wouldn't read all this, but what in really broad sense is leaders, they should have a clarity of purpose. They should be very clear what they want to do. Like the, like the child, Robert, right? He was very clear. My purpose is to avoid the lions eating my livestock. Very clear, very clarity of purpose. Courage. You can't be a leader if you don't have courage, if you don't have risk-taking abilities. If you're not willing to take that foot forward. Yes. If he was not willing, if he was not, that could have backfired, right? The guy could have been eaten by the lion. Mm -hmm. He walked around to experiment to say if a moving light was deterring the lion. The lions could have eaten him. He had to have that courage. Okay? And commitment. He didn't give up. His first experiment failed. His second experiment failed. He didn't give up. Commitment. Commitment to the cause. So at a broad level, unless you have these characteristics and you don't evidence these characteristics, very unlikely that you will feel yourself your leader and people will acknowledge you to be a leader. So you have to have some of these characteristics. And I wouldn't read the details. That's, that's Come on. Can somebody help me? Okay. Authenticity, we talked about it, right? So two, I've just highlighted the two words. That, that come to mind when you talk about authentic leaders. Mahatma Gandhi. Mm. Authenticity. What was the authenticity in Mahatma Gandhi? Or Martin Luther King. I'll come to Martin Luther King. How many of you have heard of Martin Luther King? What was he famous for? He brought in the, the revolution, right? Yes. <laughs> oh, let's take an, an industry example we talk about. Apple. Authentic, right? So, the two things which stand out, I think there's a lot of words there, right? Authentic leaders demonstrate a passion for their purpose, practice their values, and lead with their hearts as well as with their heads. Right? They establish long-term meaningful relationships. You don't establish a relationship for the purposes of a meeting. Right? You establish long-term. And have the self-discipline to get the results. So they, they know who they are. And it's very important. The awareness of who I am I is the first step a leader needs to do. If I don't know what who I am I, what are my capabilities, what are my limitations, I will never grow. So self-awareness is the first step. I've highlighted the two words, passion and practice. Because that's what becomes evident to people. When, when somebody looks at you as a leader, what strikes them is, do you have the passion? Are you practicing what you say? Okay, I'll just probably skip through some of this, but this helps you if you if you need to understand what. Give me some guides. Give me some tips. As I said, there are tips also. You need to create a desire for improvement because if you if you think that everything is working well, complacency is the first enemy of leadership. Everything is working fine. You never create a leader. Right? You have to be able to see there is a an improvement and the desire, right? And then you have to take your people along. I can't sit in a corner and think, I think the whole world is wrong, I'm going to correct it. I've got a desire and passion. <laughs> nobody follows me. <laughs> I can't, right? So you have to be able to pass the same thing to people. And how do you do that? <coughs> By encouraging. 
you have to be able to encourage people. People have different skills. Don't like to try to create people who are like you. Then you're not creating leadership. A leadership is collective diversity. If you try and select a guy, oh, I like him because he's like me. <laughs> you have to encourage horses for courses. There are different courses. There are different types of horses which we know the courses. As a leader, your skill is to be able to identify for this course what is the right horse, and for this course what is the right horse, and not put, and not put the same horse on every course. And that's where you fail. You, we have all the types of skills in people. Where we fail as leaders is when we pick the right guy for the wrong job. Okay. Two more. Promote cooperation with standard. As so, as a leader, what do you definitely require? First and foremost, character, integrity. If you fail that test, <coughs> why do you think a lot of our politicians and now the ITLs as well <laughs> are not treated as leaders? They fail this. They fail the character test. Right? I used to remember when my mom. One <coughs> of the first things she taught me is when character is lost, when wealth and health are lost, you still can regain them. I still think it's. It's, it's a value that in the passing generation we have chosen to ignore. Right? But as a leader, that is a prerequisite. It will catch up with you at some time. You may be able to fool some people for some time, or all people for some time, but not all people for all time. Personal capability. Your science. If you don't have the science within you, Right? Even in the, the, the Roberts guy, he had science. He ripped open his uh, mother's transistor, took the battery, took the indicator. He didn't just go and do something. He still applied logic. He applied science. So you still need to have capability. You can't just be a leader without having the basic capability. Results focused. You have to be results focused. You can't say, I'm a leader. I, I think, what, what's your goals? And one of the things I ask people who are the managers or other managers I see is, what's your goal? Well, they are not able to articulate that to me in three sentences. They are not thought this way. If you don't know what your goal is, you should have a very clear articulation of what your goal is. Because without a goal, there is no sense of purpose. Interpersonal skills. You can't run this alone. You have to run this. Leadership is a collective effort. It's not a single effort. It's one person who gets recognized, but the outcome is collective. And hence, you need interpersonal ability to initiate, lead, etc. Move on. So, what are the most important things that you should avoid? What are the fatal flaws? Inability to learn from a mistake, cardinal sin. The problem is not making a mistake. The problem is not acknowledging the mistake and not learning from the mistake. Right? I keep telling my managers to say, "I am upset." For <coughs> upset, not because somebody has made one wrong decision. I am upset because of two reasons. Either the person has made no decision at all, or has not learned from the mistake. So in, 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 in corporate world, you are unlikely to get fired if you don't make a decision. So lack of core intelligence skills, lack of openness. Closed. I think I am the most intelligent guy in this world. I will not listen to anybody's idea. <laughs> you have killed leadership at its temple. Leadership, and you see the most successful leaders are people who have taken everybody's idea and brought it together as a collective idea. And not people who have championed their own ideas. Look at any mass movement. Okay. Accountability initiative we talked about. What? So if you really have to do things, <coughs> You can't just create a leader with passion, right? We said we also need the science, we also need the competency. But you also need an environment where you could do it. Look at the child Robert, right? He was given that environment to be able to test his bulbs, right? So when you only do leadership out of competency and passion, you're doing it for a hobby. Because there's no purpose. Why am I doing it? There's no organizational lead. I'm just trying to practice leadership because I think I have my leadership in me, and I think I've got the competencies to back me, but there's no purpose. So I'm doing it for a hobby. That is why the intersection of these two is called a hobby. 
if I am doing it, there is a purpose and I have a passion, but I don't have the science. I don't know how to do it. Then I'm a rookie. Right? But where and when if I have the competency and I have the purpose, but I don't have the passion, I do it as a job. When my manager tells me do this, please I do it. I don't know. I think I know. But I don't have the passion. I don't have the energy. I do it as a as a piece of work, right? As a task. But when all these three interface together, I have the capability, I have the passion, and I have the purpose of why I'm doing it. That's Make sense? Mm. One. I wouldn't go through this. You can, you can read this. What are the success factors? More. So developing leaders, I only go through some of the important things. So when you have to develop, now you have to start thinking where do I start? How do I develop leaders? One of the first things to do is ask others for input. You never, because in your mind as human beings, we all believe that we are the perfect creatures that God has made. There are no flaws. The flaws are everybody else. <laughs> right? That's a human tendency to behave. And the only way you can break that human tendency is when you get an input. Sometimes these inputs can be shockers. Right? You never thought performance appraisal. <laughs> I never thought my manager thought like this. I thought I was the right guy. Right? So, but sometimes, I'm not saying which is right or which is wrong, but these are shockers. Which is why sometimes we do 360 degree assessments. Have you got 360 degree assessments? Where your manager, your peers, and your subordinates rate you. And sometimes, the first time you do it, 99 out of 100 people are shocked. That shit shocked. Because I live in my own classroom. The other thing you should also, I said that my horses to courses uh, example, identify who needs development in what area. Don't try and put everybody on a management development program when they are core competent, that they, are, they, they need to develop into something else, their passion is to develop into something else. You need to be able to identify your horses. Yeah. Don't select people who are just like you. Mistake a lot of managers do. I like this guy. He works exactly like me. Let me get five people. <laughs> what will happen? The whole department will collapse. <laughs> Other mistake I do. Don't ignore quieter people. We have a natural tendency. The person who speaks loud, the person who's coming up is the most brilliant guy. The guy who's sitting in the corner doesn't say anything. Let me ignore him. Maybe he's got it. But your, as a leader, your skill is in how do I make that person open up? So don't ignore quite and don't give extra attention to people. Be explicit in what leadership and skills your department requires. Right? Not everybody needs to be a general manager. <laughs> be practical. What do you need in your department? Create what you need. Don't over engineer it or under engineer. Allow mistakes. I'm not saying go and do a mistake every time, but <laughs> As go, going back to the example, <clears throat> make a decision, out of 100 decisions, you do one wrong decision as long as you know that you have done a mistake and you have learned from the mistakes. Because without allowing a mistake, <clears throat> and this is a, I'll give you a typical example. Who do you think are the leaders? The leaders are the people who have made the maximum amount of mistakes. However, they have the capability that they have corrected that mistake before somebody else has spotted it. That's why they are leaders. It's not the people who make the least amount of mistakes. They are the people who make the maximum amount, but they have the, the capability in them to be aware, self-aware of their mistakes, and they correct it much before anybody else. <coughs> okay? The final one, know when to pull the plug. Everything is fine. I mean, uh, oh, I think this guy will come. I, let me motivate him. He still doesn't improve. Let me motivate him. You should still know when to pull the plug. Performance management is equally important both on the positive and negative side. You have to know which is not your horse. <clears throat> equally important. Okay. Concept of middles. How many of you know this? You have always heard the truth is in the middle. It's not in the extremes. Similarly, leadership, most of the leadership decisions are always in the middle. Because at the extremes, you have, a, you have uncertainty. So you will take balanced risks. Mm -hmm. So you will take a risk. You have to take a risk as a leader. But at the same time, you don't take a risk which drowns your company. So you have to do a balanced view. So a balanced view is when you work in the middles. And you have to have that ability 
And as human beings, we are biased towards the extremes. We are always biased towards the extremes. So it's the ability to be able to come to the center. Clarify your communication. This is the other important thing. You say, oh, I am a leader. But have you at the start of the year clarified what are your expectations from you? If I have not been able to clarify my expectations from you, how do you know what is expected? So it's very important as leaders, that that's why at the start of the year, you're supposed to have a discussion with all your associates and set them goals. Not just give them a scorecard and say, this is your scorecard. I don't know about this. At the end of the year, we'll look at it. That's not how it is. You have to say, what is your goal? Why is that your goal? How is it going to be measured? What are you going to do? Get feedback, yeah, more. I think these are. And what are the performance expectations? One of the important things is following through on commitments. You give a commitment, stick to it. Stick to it. And what happens normally here? Because either people don't stick to a commitment or they fear to give a commitment. Either way, you are not displaying the issues. Involving the right people, teamwork, never make a decision alone. Even if you think your decision is right, still sound it off somebody. And that's what called in management terminology, sounding goals. You say, I've got a sounding board. It's because if that person may have a different view, may ask you a question that you may not have thought. <coughs> right? Approachability, availability. I can be a great, I can think I'm a great leader. I have all these ideas. But if you guys can't walk up to me or walk up to anybody in that manner, and uh, I'm so close to say, I'm too busy, I can't talk to you. Right? <coughs> Final ones, encouraging development, we talked about it, talking, sharing initiative, flexibility, willingness to change. As a lead, if, you're, if you think you're a leader, you should be open. There's only one thing which is constant in life, that is change. You have to be willing. So, so what are some of the misconceptions you have? Managers are people who have got a lot of authority. Right? Authority always flows top down. Right? These are misconceptions. Managers must always control their people. Managers must forge on, look, look at forging. That means, ah, I look to be good to you. Right? I should give an impression that I am good. I am not good. I don't like you. But I should look, I should smile to you, I should talk to you, give you that impression. Right? Managers will ensure that things run smoothly. That's a very controversial statement. Everybody will be the right. Because it will not. And, yet, and that's when a manager's or leader's ability comes through. If everybody thinks running smoothly, you start asking, why am I a manager? Why should I be here? So, you're allowed to run that smoothly, but then you're, look, you have to look at your goalpost moves. It's like high jump. You've done six feet. What happens? The bar moves to 6.1. It keeps on moving until you fail. I think that's all, isn't it? Is there anything more? Yeah, so I think, uh, so what can you do for yourself? This is very important. I think, think of, while it's important at the end of this session to feel optimistic, I think I know, right? you should also feel realistic. Right? Am I realistic in this? And the only way to find that is, you ask for it. This is what I want to do. This is what I think I'm capable of. Do you think? Right? And there are different mechanisms to get the feedback. And 360 is only one model. There are a number of feedback mechanisms that we can do. And finally, don't lose yourself in the role. Ultimately, you are a person. Don't try to put so much of a mask on yourself that you lose yourself. Leaders are good leaders because they have not lost themselves. Ultimately, their characters shines through. If you put a mask on, as I said, it will come off at some point. So, while you should adapt, don't adapt in a manner that you have lost yourself. Don't become a completely different person. Okay, I think I've covered it. I think what I'll do is, if you have another 10 minutes, um, and I want to just um, create one more controversial discussion before we close. I think we're up. Yeah. So, <clears throat> So I think you've gone through both, right? You've gone through the heart and the head. The first half, we focused on the heart. Let's feel what it is. Then we took some theory. What are the head things that we need to be as a leader? So if, if all of this is 
known, why is it only that some people are more successful and why is not why is it not that everybody is successful? So, okay. So one is give up, okay? <coughs> The misconceptions we have, we use this question. Okay. Don't want to take the risk. Yeah. But I think those are theory that we have learned, right? So at the end of this theory, assuming that you feel right in the heart, you know all the theory, you are doing all the right things. You have got the science, you have got the risk-taking ability. Even there are hundreds of people who do that, thousands of people who do it, millions of people who do it. But no millions of leaders, right? Fear of failures. Maybe, but still, there is something else. And I want to get to that something else. Conviction. Conviction. Conviction is also there. I've, I've gone through my feeling, right? I've, I've, I've learned it. I mean, it's not just this. There are millions of people who feel right and who are doing the right things. But not all millions become. There is only one Mahatma Gandhi. Consistency. Opportunity. Lack of passion. Maybe. There were hundreds of freedom fighters when, when Mahatma Gandhi was around, right? Opportunity was there. Lack of passion. There is only one Apple, iPhone. You can say Samsung is a good, good enough competition, but that's fine. There are hundreds of. Uh, uh, so we'll 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 just spend about ten minutes looking at Apple. I, I'll either take Mahatma Gandhi or Martin Luther King, whichever is your, uh, you know, Martin Luther King as well. I think. <coughs> Right? And, and implementation is one aspect. Uh, consistent. Implementation, consistency. They yeah. Communicate. Loyal to users and loyal targets. Fine. There are all reasons. No, but what I'm saying is there are in the in the billions of people we have in the world, they would have understood this by now. But still, there are only few people. So again, look at aircrafts, right? Who who invented aircrafts? Right. 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 At the time, Wright brothers were inventing or were in the. There were hundreds of other people who were doing the same thing. Mm -hmm. But only right brothers succeed. Persistence. Persistence is one thing, yeah. Purpose. Vision. Power, persistence, they are all, all related. OK, there is one science, and I'll come to that in a moment, right? <laughs> have, you, have any of you uh, read about Simon Sinek? Or, or seen his uh, man? He also comes on 10. OK, this is one philosophy that he's come with. He calls this the golden circles. Three golden circles. What? How? Why? Right? And he gives this typical Apple example. And I'll go to this Apple example of what he says. He says <clears throat> Apple is, you know, Apple is more successful than most of the other brands. So if you want to really look at an authentic phone, if you don't have a price constraint, you'll go and buy an Apple. Right? No debate, no debate on it. So if you have the money, you would go and buy an iPhone. Because you believe it's authentic. So but there are cheaper versions. Why are people not buying that? Why do I want to spend that money? Right? So there is something that Apple is doing, which the others are not doing. And that's what he's trying to explain. I'll, I'll do the same example with Martin Luther King. So <clears throat> what he says is that it's in the way you communicate. Normally, all organizations or all organizations communicate outside in. They start saying, we produce great computers. They have the, these following designs, blah, 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 blah. So if I assume that for a minute, if Apple was communicating, let's say Apple was communicating like this, to say, we have the greatest computer in the world. It's got the features. It's got the design. It's easy to use, blah, 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 blah. That's one way of communicating, right? Or if Apple says, now look at this style of communication, right? You go, they go and say, our desire is to challenge status quo. And the means that we do to desire to challenge the status quo is by producing products which have the right features, easy to use, and have adapted. By the way, we also make a computer. Which sounds better? What's the difference? <coughs> they reverse the order in which they sold the product. In the first one, I started by saying, what do I do? How do I do? I didn't say why I did it as a leader. The other one, they reverse the order. They said, why am I doing it? How am I approaching it? By the way, this is also what we produce. See the difference. Right? 
And you know where the science is, uh, this is, though this is taught as management science, you know where this is, where this is coming from? It's coming from biology. So if you have learned some element of biology, how, how, how is your brain broken up into three parts? Outer brain, two inner brains. Outer brain is all about logic. This talks about So my products, what, what am I trying to sell and all that, right? So the, the logical, the reasoning, your, your head side, right? While the inner two pieces of brain talk about the, the heart side. Why am I doing So people normally follow somebody when they are able to feel the same as the other person. People followed Mahatma Gandhi or Martin Luther King. Why? Because they believed in the same values as what Mahatma Gandhi or Martin Luther King believed. Right? So I don't know if you know Martin Luther King ran this big moment in America. So he called 250,000 people for a session, and this was way back. He did not have emails, internet, etc. at that point, or they were not as prominent. No time was given, no venue was given. But 250,000 people spent hours traveling to go and listen to him at the right place at the right time. Why did they do that? Martin Luther King didn't go and say what he was trying to achieve. He only said, why am I want, why do I want to change? And the people who believed and were able to relate themselves in their beliefs to what he believed followed him. So when Apple says that this is why we stand for, and if we are able to relate ourselves, so look at all these examples. When the Apple launches this new phone, there are some people who, are, who spend their extra money and buy it in the first week, right? Do they buy it for Apple? They buy it for themselves. Because they believe in the same thing as much as Apple believes. Right? So <coughs> communication is an extensive part of leadership. Right? And you have to always start with the why. If you are not able to convince people who will follow the why, they will not listen to your how or your what. Okay. So this is one trait as a leader that you should be able to develop to say, how comfortable am I with the why? I'll give you one more example. I forgot the name of this um, uh, product, but there is a product, now it comes on Dish TV, etc. that allows you to pause TV, rewind TV, etc. Right? It causes life. But the, the actual product came out in the uh, in UK or uh, Europe, right? <clears throat> that was the best technological innovation at that point of time. And it still is, right? The ability to be able to rewind your life. But it was a big commercial failure. You know why? Because they went by what? How did they sell it? They try and sell it. Do you know? We have a product which allows you to rewind, blah, 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 and people got scared. What they should have done is, they should have worked on the why. Why do you, why do you think, and hey, we have got a product for you. Right? So it is that ability to be able to understand and do it. Right, brothers? Right? So what do you think, when, when somebody has been given an opportunity as a leader to develop something, what do you think are the most important things that he needs? Give me three, because it's easy. Yeah, more importantly, funds. I need money. There are a budget, I can't do it. Right? I need people. The right capability people to work with me. Right? And I need a plan, or more importantly, I need a team. I need an environment where I can actually. So, for instance, I'm trying to develop something and nobody needs it. Why am I developing? So, when. <coughs> The right, and people believe that if these three are there, I will succeed. And almost all commercial examples have shown that these are not the last. So, for instance, whether it's Wright Brothers, right. while Wright Brothers were trying to invent uh, the flying machine in 1903, there were other organizations who also were trying it. And there was somebody appointed by the government itself had loads of funds. The money was not an issue. The mo in most intelligent brains. People were on it. And they were given the license by the government. So what better environment do you need? 
but they failed. Why? Because people did not have a conviction because people did not want to deal with ambiguity, people did not have a passion. So when people started working for what they created, the what, they started failing. When Wright brothers started working for why they wanted to succeed, they succeeded. So if you look at most examples, the why, so you should always start your leadership with a, so starting to develop as a leader, ask the question why. What do you want to achieve? Ask the question why. Because the why gives you the goal. The how gives you the method to achieve the goal, right? And the what gives you the final outcome. Right? So if you start with the outcome without knowing what your goal is, then I can do. <coughs> Thank you all. Um, that was what I had. Um, so, how many of you feel your leaders? You don't have to be worried. In your heart, how many of you feel your leaders? There you go. You need to feel in your heart you're a leader. Because the science can be learned. The other bit has to be felt. It has to be an experience.